Okay, our uh, 18D conservation partner spotlight. Secretary Wasley informational, an overview of a key conservation partner program will be shared with the commission. Secretary Wasley. Thank you, Chairman Johnston. Uh, just by way of history, really quickly, um, shortly after being appointed to the commission, Commissioner East uh, expressed a desire to hear from uh, conservation organizations, from some of the non-governmental organizations that existed around the state. Um, she wanted to hear um, a little bit about those, those programs, what their priorities were, what their issues were, and that spawned this reoccurring agenda item, Conservation Partner Spotlight. So when I learned that we were uh, coming to, to Hawthorne, um, I knew historically there was a Mineral County Sportsman's Club, but I didn't know the, the current status. And um, we asked a few questions and, and quickly uh, learned that the, the Mineral County Sportsman's uh, Club existed and had been kind of re revitalized from a from a historic um, sportsman's club and i just i just wanted to say a, a couple things before uh, i turn it over to the the chairman of the club first of all um, when you look around at, at non-governmental organizations and sportsman's clubs nowadays there really seems to be um, more and more species specific groups whether it's it's pheasants forever or you know the quail unlimited or sheep groups or deer groups uh chucker groups there are a lot of species groups and if you think back 30 years ago uh, there may have been ducks unlimited rocky mountain elk foundation mule deer foundation but now when you when you watch talks uh, you go to meetings and you look at the logos and the the ngos they've gotten more and more diverse and more and more divided in standing behind individual species. And as, as they've done that, I think they've also recognized that, uh, that the benefits of who they are um, are much broader than those individual species. And then they try to reach back out, broaden themselves. So uh, Pheasants Forever, for example, is doing a ton of work right now on pollinators and realizing that pollinators are really important for creating food for, for pheasants. Uh, Nevada Bighorns Unlimited, which originally started behind one of these species groups in, in Bighorn, does a ton of work to fund captures, uh, antelope, the mule deer habitat restoration. Uh, but you don't see the, the historic models too often that are the, the sportsman club. These aren't, they aren't uh, necessarily a species group, but they are a group that kind of unifies um, sportsmen in a, in a broader community-based type effort. And I just, um, I think that the name in and of itself says a lot about the group, uh, about who they are, about what they do. They're not trying to set themselves apart and picking a species here or there, but they're a group uh, of sportsmen, by sportsmen, uh, for sportsmen, and, and active in, in the community. And I think that'll become evident uh, when we hear from the chairman and he shares some of their some of their priorities and some of the projects so um, I don't I don't want to speak much more there's just a couple things I want to say um, I want to read their mission which is to maintain benefit and secure recreational use of our lands in Mineral County and that's that's pretty darn broad and again um, I think there's there's really uh, strength in in that Brett I also want to give them a quick Plug. They have their annual banquet here in town on, on July 20th. That's that's a Saturday, um, and I know they uh, they sell out, um, but it's a it's a pretty awesome event um, here in town. Um, and with that, uh, I guess I turn it over to to Rob Mathias, who's who's the chairman. I also want to thank them for uh, hosting us for for dinner last night. It was a it was an awesome meal, an awesome opportunity. And I want to thank Commissioner East for, for giving us the opportunity to go to these places and hear from, from some of these organizations and uh, anxious to hear what Rob has to share with us today. Rob? Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, welcome to Hawthorne, America's Patriotic Home. Um, and we want to thank the Commission for this opportunity to speak to you about the Mineral County Sportsman's Club and uh, what we're doing in the community. Um, the history of the Mineral County Sportsman's Club about 
40, 50 years ago, there, there, there was, it was started, and it was a bunch of men that got together and formed the club, actually gave out um, cards saying they were a Mineral County Sportsman's member, and they were youth-oriented, so they did things for the youth in the community. Um, and that, over the years, dissolved. They used to meet here in the El Cap, I think on a monthly basis. So over the years, that kind of dissolved. And so my nephew, Darren Hamry, he's the vice chairman of the Mineral County Sportsman Club. He, uh, he kept coming to me saying, you know, let's get the Mineral County Sportsman Club going again. I'm going, nah, it's not gonna work. You know, it's just too much. And he's going, really, we could do a lot. We could do a lot. And so he kept bugging me, bugging me. Finally, we, we uh, put something in the paper. Hey, um, if you're interested in be, uh, getting this Mineral County Sportsman's Club going, come to the meeting. And uh, we had a great turnout of uh, men and women. And so we got it going again. And we've been going for seven years now. So uh, we're 180 members. Um, of course, there's only a hand few, uh, uh, a handful that really worked their butt off, but um, that's that's something to speak about, really. Um, we have a uh, a great partnership with Endow and MBU, and we want to continue to build on that partnership. Um, we work well together. Um, After 9-11, really is when it, things hit home here because of the depot closing everything, it really reduced the outdoor recreation access. And then losing Walker Lake as a, a, as a fishery here really brought the Sportsman's Club to light that we needed to get that club going and, and get some things where we could get those things back and be a voice. Um, so when we formed, we, we set out um, some projects, some long-term, short-term, things that we, we thought we could tackle, wanted to get done in the community. Um, one of them was the shooting range, and a little history about the shooting range. The shooting range that was here since I can remember, where we'd go sight in our rifles, was east of here, going towards Mina. Um, a little shooting range out there. That's where everybody would go, sight in their rifles, and what have you. Well, it turned out to be that was on Army property. And uh, some things happened out there that um, the range control officer for the, for the Army uh, shut it down because it was uh, filthy out there. People shoot propane bottles, uh, just doing terrible things out there. So that got shut down. So now we, then we had people shooting all over the place out here, which is dangerous. Starts fires, uh, just, just not good. So that was one of the goals that we established. Um, the bad thing is 80% of the land in Mineral County is federally owned. So where are we gonna put the shooting range? So we, we partnered up with BLM. Um, they put us on the resource management plan, uh, which is a 10-year deal. And there's a piece of land um, just west of here by the dump that would work fine to put um, a, sh a good shooting range in. And we were going to apply for the grant from Mendow to help us accomplish that. Well, we can't apply to Endow if we don't have any land. So that has been in, in, in the works, and we don't know. Of course, you know the red tape, all that. Congress has to approve that. So we're still pursuing that project. Um, we've even been working with the depot, the commander, and the new range control officer. They would like to get that shooting range back up, but there's some issues that probably more uh, the sportsmen wouldn't want to do, and that's where you have to go register your gun down there, and I don't think people are going to do that. So we're kind of trying to work those issues. 
So that's one of the long-term goals. Um, the other one was establishing a fishing pond in, in town here. So people that didn't have four-wheel drive and they could take their family down in the car, or the kids could go down there and, and, and fish. Um, most rural counties, you see there's, there's an urban pond there. They can go fish, take their kids there, picnic. Um, we approached the county. Um, they did give us some land near um, Nevada Energy, just to the west of us here. Where, and there is water available that the county, they purge uh, from this well on a daily basis, which could fill the pond. Um, but they want, the county wanted so much from us to, uh, and it, we knew it was gonna take a lot of money for design, all that. So it, we kind of put it on the back burner. But we, we still wanna pursue that. There's some avenues now that we can, uh, there's a, new, a mine now in town. We could approach them. Maybe we could get, have them donate some stuff and get that going. So um, just we would really like to see that go. Also, um, speaking of, of ponds, we, uh, we wanted to do the, uh, we wanted to establish a, a fish derby for the kids. Well, of course, we didn't have anywhere to do that. <laughs> We had Walker River, but we didn't want to take the kids over there. That would be, you know, we thought that would be a little dangerous. So, um, and Rose Creek wasn't uh, stocked with trout, just the chewy, t uh, t chewy tub, uh, chub, I'm sorry. Um, so we established the fish derby and uh, we took uh, the kids over to the cooling ponds in Yarrington. So that was our, our first fish derby that we put on. After that, we were able to negotiate and with partnership with Endow, get Rose Creek opened up where they would stock it with the tiger trout. And uh, that's where we've been holding our, our fish derbies. We've been um, averaging about 100 kids a year up there um, with their families. just. The whole reservoir just completely packed. It was just awesome to see that. And we would, uh, we would buy about, oh, probably $1,500 worth of uh, fishing gear and, and just raffles. And it was just a great day. And the, the community really loves that. And we want to thank Endow for, for helping us with that and, and stocking that Rose Creek area for us. Um, also, in the Rose Creek area, there's, there's a cabin up there, and it, that never used to be accessed, uh, available to the community. And we were able to negotiate with, with the depot to open that up to the public. So all of you can call it the depot at Base Security, Building 15, and you can rent that cabin for the weekend for about five bucks. Go up there. And, and take your family, fish, stay the weekend up there, and it's beautiful, beautiful little cabin. At, and we went up there and renovated the cabin. Some bears got in up there and kind of destroyed, they had a, there's a porch on it and the bears were trying to get in there. So we went up there and, and renovated the cabin. And, um, it has, it has uh, a gas stove in there, refrigerator, shower. Um, the fire department goes up there and fills the tank every year, so you have running water up there, hot water. Um, the sportsman club pays for the propane up there, also for the porta potties. So uh, that, that's a great deal, great deal for the community. You know, I can remember going up there with, with my dad when I was just a little guy, and he had rainbow trout in there. Just, it was a, it was a great place to go. Um, other projects, um, we, we also developed a uh, Mineral County High School scholarship, $500. We hand out every year to a recipient of Mineral County High School. And it has to kind of relate to the mission, tie into outdoor recreation, maybe getting into uh, wildlife management. It's, it's hard to 
to get that to fit into the mission, but we do give a $500 scholarship each year. So that's a great thing for the community. Um, also, we assist MBU endow on guzzler builds here. Uh, Mineral County is probably the, the guzzler capital of the world. <laughs> Uh, but you can see the results of that with the sheep um, and benefiting other wildlife. It's just amazing, and uh, we appreciate that partnership and, and being a part of it. Also, we've purchased drinkers to support those builds, um, so uh, that's been a good asset to to that project, to those projects. Also, we've assisted with uh, sheep capture and monitoring. Um, been on a few of those to help with that. That's a neat. That's a neat deal. If nobody's ever done that. I, I did a couple of them, and it was a great experience. Also, we donated uh, some some money to Endow for the tra new transportation trailer. Um, we purchased and installed crappie beds for Weber Reservoir. Also, we established a, a, a kayak day at Walker Lake. Um, two years ago, when, when the lake came up 13, 14 feet, um, we got kind of excited, you know. And not a lot of people have been using the lake. So we were like, let's approach a couple other organizations and, and see if they want to do a kayak day out the lake. We'll buy some sandwiches from Portisub, and uh, whoever wants to come, bring the kids. And we'll get out there with some kayaks. And it turned out to be a great event. We had a lot of people show up, a lot of kids. Um, we had people with paddle boards, kayaks. And it, it was just a great day. And it, it sparked a, little, a lot of interest in just people buying kayaks. So uh, we, we're going to continue that event. Um, we're going to have it sometime in August this year. But uh, uh, just a great, great event to you know, support Walker Lake. Um, also, we're, we, uh, we hold uh, cleanup days um, out in the outdoors. We just went up to Lucky Boy Pass, and if you've ever been to the top of Lucky Boy, there's a place called Sled Hill. That's where everybody goes sledding in the, uh, in the winter. And, of course, there's just tons of trash. So the Sportsman's Club got together. There was probably 15 of us. Um, Got up there and oh boy, we we picked, we had about 15 bags of trash and just all kinds of stuff. So we we do events like that. We go clean up our our area, you know, keep it clean. Also, with that, we partnered with the U.S. Forest Service and we put signs up on uh, a lot of our recreation areas out here with road access. Stay on the roads. And it has the U.S. Sports Service logo and the Mineral County Sportsman's logo on it. So keep them, tell them to stay on the roads. Projects that we're pursuing. Um, the depot has what they call an arms agreement. And it's where you can lease property from them, uh, land, what have you. And if you all know, you, all of you know the... the the south end of the lake is there's no access and that's probably some of the best duck hunting in the state um, so we've approached them to possibly doing a lease agreement with with the sportsman's club um, so we could have access to that area for duck hunting um, so that's in the works we'll see how how that goes um, also, another project that we're going to pursue is renovation of Monument Beach, which is the old state beach, which I, I call Old Ski. Um, they have, that's a picnic area. They have awnings down there. But the awnings are painted brown, so you can't even see them from, from driving on the highway. So we're going to go down there and brighten up those, those awnings. Um, we're paying for the porta potties down there and the removal of garbage, the Sportsman's Club is, with an agreement with the county for three years. So we're gonna go down there and make that, and then we just, the county put a, a boat ramp down there so the, the lake's accessible with boat. So we're gonna, we're gonna brighten that, 
area up down there a little bit. Hopefully people will start using that down there. Um, also, for another fishery, we approached, you know, the state bought the Hilton uh, Estates, um, which involved Nine Mile, the Hilton Ranch, and Fletcher is a part of that, which is, uh, that, that uh, could become a nice little pond area for fishing. So we're working with the state, trying to uh, get that established for another fishery in Mineral County. Um, also, uh, NDOT is gonna put a welcome sign down by McDonald's there, on the front of McDonald's. Like you see in every uh, city, rural area, welcome to Ely, welcome to Fallon. Um, they're gonna put a sign down there. It's gonna say, welcome to America's patriotic home, Hawthorne, Nevada. And the Sportsman's Club purchased a Desert Bighorn bronze sheet to put down there uh, next to that sign because we're pretty proud of what's going on here with the, uh, the, the Nelson Desert Bighorn sheet and uh, display that. And uh, I think that's going to be a neat uh, addition to the town. So um, other than that, that's what we've been doing. We're just trying to... Uh, make our, our recreation better here, and establish it, maintain it, and uh, partnership with, with Endow and MBU and, and just uh, enhance recreation and wildlife. So I appreciate the, uh, letting us have a chance to educate what we're doing in the community, and uh, I hope your experience here was good, and uh, we welcome you back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mathias. I uh, appreciate hearing what's going on and because we don't get an opportunity to hear what various different groups do. And I love to hear about groups doing things focused on kids and getting them in the outdoors and doing different things. And thank you for your hospitality uh, for us here. I, I love coming out to the rural communities, although I don't live too far away since I'm just <laughs> <laughs> over the mountain you guys uh, sure. went to the top of yesterday so sure thank you yeah uh, and uh, it's, if there's any question I'm sorry um, please ask and uh, I know you guys were in great hands with uh, Glenn and Marlene that it's like all state you know <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're great people I've known them for years and uh, so I'm glad they were here to take care of you guys and I'm glad we were able to provide the dinner for you guys and Again, we just welcome you guys to come back again. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions on what we're doing, um, we invite you to the banquet. Um, it's a great deal. It's, it's kind of like what MBU does, but on a smaller scale, you know. Um, but it's a great night. Um, it, it gives us a lot of money to do a lot of things. Um, so uh, that's what it's all about, uh, helping each other, getting that money so we can enhance wildlife and in our recreation areas, so, um, and I appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you. Any, any questions? Any questions? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not so much a uh, question, but just a couple of comments. First of all, thank you for dinner last night. It was very welcoming, and really appreciate you guys doing that for us. But um, while you're talking, you know, you guys have had some challenges down here with Walker Lake and stuff, and. Um, while you're talking, uh, what really stood out to me, and I, I appreciate um, the fact that uh, you've really kept your feet moving, and um, you know you're not doing the traditional stuff. You know you're cleaning things up. You're sending different messages out there. You're, you know, yeah. uh, shooting propane tanks. You know it's not okay. And you know you guys are working to fix it. They've been cleaning up areas that have been trashed out, and yeah. you're kayaking. Um, you're sending a way different message, and and. Um, I just wanted to give you props for that. I think it's, uh, um, you guys are seeing a little different opportunity and a little broader message and that uh, stood out to me. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.
I don't go to, to shooting ranges very often, but one of my questions after this is how big of a swath of land is necessary for a shooting range? Well, that's a good question. Um, we looked at the, the plans at Winnemucca, that, that footprint that they did, and I can't even remember what the acreage was for theirs, but it, it's not all that big. Um, we wanted to include, of course, a place to shoot bow and arrow, uh, a long range and short range, have a, a, a building on it so we could use it for training, for um, um, meetings for the, uh, the, the, cl the club, um, also doing training there, um, what have you. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I really can't answer your question. Yeah, as far as, but it doesn't have to be very big. But the, the problem is, is it's just, there's no, there's hardly any land here in Mineral County. 80% uh, federally owned, and I'm not kidding you. It's, so it's, uh, it's tough to do, to, to find it. And BLM, they were more than happy to give us that land, but it has to go through all that uh, red tape Congress approve it, and you, you, we know what Congress is doing right now. They're not getting anything done. So, but it, it's uh, it's something that we truly need here uh, for have people out there just shooting randomly everywhere, and uh, you're going to cause problems. Somebody get injured, wildland fire, what have you. You know, so. Um, very important that uh, we keep pursuing that and and get it done, you know. And, and it's just a it's value added to the community economically. I mean, it, you you hold uh, a bow and arrow sh shoot, you know. Uh, those those uh, families come in with their camp trailers and go to those shoots. Um, it's just amazing what what they do with that. So um, it would just benefit us. The, the community, so, and economically, so. Any additional questions, comments? Thank you again. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Yes? Bunch. I'd like to help Rob out there a little bit. He's, he's done real great. Um, the Sportsman's Club is just, they're my fallback. When I have questions, I <clears throat> rely to them. Um, one of their, their advice is, uh, sits on the advisory board. And so my representation, I may not have a lot of sportsmen at my meeting, but I have the sportsman's input. But <clears throat> the, one of the problems that, we're, that is dealt with that he didn't go into with getting acquiring property from BLM. For BLM to approve it, it's got to go to Congress. They have to approve it. But you have to get a legislature to support you. And usually when you try to get a legislator to support you with something like this, it becomes a trade-off. If you want this acre of land, you've got to give several acres of land in your county to the wilderness people that it's declared a wilderness. And that's part of the things. We're bound by public land and government. And we don't want to give up any of our public land to wilderness. Because when you get wilderness, then your access is, is not as available. So when the constraint with land that we have, with being mostly government in the area, government owned, it's it's a trade-off. and you. We encountered this back when Senator Reed was still in office. The Mineral County wanted this land he's talking about in land trade, and they wanted land down south. And immediately, the wilderness people wanted the whole Gillis Range to become wilderness, and several other areas in Mineral County. And everybody in the county said no. Well, that put everything on hold, because if you're not going to give something up, you're not going to get anything. So those are the problems that is encountered with them. 
And I just wanted to elaborate with that. For people that's been through it, you know what happened in Lyon County. <laughs> Absolutely. We traded a small piece of land for a copper mine and lost the whole south end. So for Lyon County. So it's it's one of those things, it's not one for one, it's like ten for one. So and and that's their hold up. But you know, you're probably talking no, I would much over ten acres, probably five would be great. That but, is I'm sorry, that my daughter just said yeah. great. She said it. So these are things that acres. you know and I just I just want to go on to say that <clears throat> um, several couple of years back um, we uh, search and rescue was in a pickle and I talked to the director and we are in possession of a, a boat that come in to us and on the side of that boat is uh, uh, the life jackets are painted on it and it says wear them so when they're having their kayak event the boat is out there we're sending the message to everyone wear your life jacket and that's one of the biggest pushes that I push with them. When the kids and people are out on the lake in their kayaks, wear that life jacket. That way I don't have to go get them. Okay? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I certainly thank your, think your neighbors in Lyon County and Yarrington can tell you the difficulties associated with the transfer of land and what goes into that. I think it was a six-year process for that. I don't know how many congresses it took. Any other comments or questions? Commissioner Hobbs? I'm sorry, just going back to the shooting area again. Um, so in the past, you leased it from the depot, and then they got upset, or how? Was, where was that land located? No, they finally got in. They didn't realize, the place, please. You need to go to the phone. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. It's recorded. <laughs> What they did is they they finally got educated and looked at the boundaries where the uh, where their property was, and they're like, "Whoa, the shooting range is on the army property." So um, <laughs> the, the the general manager that was in charge of operating the base at that time made an agreement with the prior range control officer um, that SOC, SOC would uh, clean that area up, put the awnings in, put some new shooting tables. And he did do that. Well, somewhere that agreement got all convoluted, okay, and nobody knew where it was at. And then this the incident occurred where our great police department went out there, and they were the ones that we're shooting propane tanks and uh, whatever else out there. So this guy, I, I mean, and this guy was, wasn't from Hawthorne, you know. Um, he, he came in from, uh, I think he was from Georgia or somewhere else, and he just didn't care. He said, I'm shutting it down. And, you know, once they shut something down, it takes an act of uh, Congress to get it back, you know. Um, unfortunately, we've been uh, pursuing them to to get it back, um, persevere, right? Don't let them tell you no. <laughs> um, but uh, they just want too many things for a sportsman to do um, that they probably wouldn't do. Uh, I'm no, I'm not going to go register my gun with them, you know. So um, maybe we could do it temporarily until we get. Um, one built, um, but or and we we can look for. I was talking to Jack last night, and I, we can look at some private land maybe for sale. And go that route. Uh, so hopefully, I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional? Okay. We'll move on then to uh, item 18E, the presentation of Fallon Naval Air Station community plans, liaison officer Robert Rule for information only. The commission will be provided an update on the current status of the FRTC modernization and conservation efforts with partners in Northern Nevada. Mr. 
at all. Are you sitting here so I can advance the slides? Uh, no, but I'd ask you just bring the mic down. Get on. Uh, can everybody hear me? So it's, it's usually not a problem. So it's usually the opposite. Um, wanted to uh, uh, thank the chairman and uh, commission for uh, having me here today. Uh, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, it gives us a chance to get out and uh, uh, tell some of the stuff that's going on with Fallon, uh, with uh, our expansion, as well as uh, some of the initiatives we've done with conservation. Um, we've done events like this uh, in the last uh, two, almost three years. About uh, we've done just interactions with the with the public and, and, and the politicians for uh, about 280 to 300 times. So uh, we've done a lot, a lot of outreach, uh, being able to tell the story uh, from uh, from our perspective to to let folks know and decision makers know. Uh, kind of what's going on so you know they can kind of have things informed for themselves so um, quick uh, 30 second me uh, um, uh, again Rob rule uh, uh, community liaison for Naval Air Station Fallon uh, I work for the commanding officer uh, my job is, is really to be uh, a link between the Navy and, and the outside world um, it, Kind of like you know, think about it as like the State Department, making sure that you know that communications are happening in both ways for, for everybody. So, um, uh, born and raised in Nevada, uh, I'm not I'm not a military guy. Uh, grew up in Reno, have two degrees from UNR. Um, I was brought in uh, about 10 years ago. I've been working there in Fallon ever since. So, I really I kind of see my job is really um, is translating. Um, the uh, ability to uh, you know to, to to figure out what's happening on the outside world and, and, and keep that communication for what the uh, Navy wants to do and, and so that that's that's really I figure figures my main job um, um, for um, uh, you know as a liaison between the outside world so um, uh, this is gonna, I'm going to break this down in about five different parts. Uh, what Fallon does, uh, an overview of the expansion, uh, really uh, that builds that logic on why the Navy uh, had asked for the land, uh, walk through kind of individual ranges, uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the natural resource side, the hunting and, and, uh, and uh, uh, wildfire management that really had come out of those public comments from EIS over the last uh, two years, and then uh, talk a little bit about again that conservation initiatives that the base has done uh, for about uh, in this particular program about the last five years. So, um, uh, so Naval Air Station Fallon um, is uh, what they call the carrier of the desert. So every uh, tactical aviation air wing comes through Fallon 90 days before they deploy to the carrier. So in terms of, of uh, uh, importance to the Department of Defense, uh, it's one of the critical assets, uh, and not only to the Navy, but to the Department of Defense. Uh, if uh, there's uh, some sort of uh, uh, action in the world or natural, natural uh, emergency, uh, first thing that uh, you know, the, the President does is say, where's my nearest carry, carrier and how, how fast can we get it there? So in terms of, what, of how we, um, uh, you know that, that that importance. We really uh, are that critical step right before uh, aviators go and deploy to the carrier. So um, the integrate uh, the, the main task for uh, NAS Fallon is that integrated training, which is both that air wing and then that strike fighter advanced readiness mm -hmm. program. Um, those are large scale trainings where um, all the um, all all different squadrons from all around the world or all around the country come to Fallon right before they, again, they deploy. So they train as an individual unit uh, at their base, and they come to Fallon to train as that integrated pole. So you can think about that in several different terms. You know, you shoot hoops in the backyard, but you come, to the, you come together as a team to uh, practice how you perform as a team 
uh, in order to, in order to you know play the game, you know how to play, whatever you think whatever you think that is. This is really where aviators come to mesh. Um, uh, we're also home at kind of uh, say it's uh, in the advanced all the advanced degrees uh, for naval aviators are are done at Fallon. Um, and, and you see the, the probably the most famous which is Top Gun, uh, but all of the tactical platforms for the Navy all have a schoolhouse in Fallon. So you know, walk through um, our um, uh, all as you see all of their um, uh, all the different elements that make up uh, uh, warfare for naval aviation. All of that is, is built in Fallon, and really what. Um, uh, the whole uh, uh, concept of that is what's called TTP, Tactics to Techniques and Procedures. So um, all of the combat aviation um, tactics, techniques, and procedures are developed and found. So uh, that's that main schoolhouse, that main bank brain trust for, for the Navy. Um, we also, uh, for the last about 10 years, uh, have hosted the SEALs uh, for their special warfare tactical ground mobility. Um, they kind of bounced around the West Coast uh, quite a bit um, uh, for that school. Uh, it is uh, uh, a very central part for the SEALs as well. It was called uh, ULT, or unit level uh, training. Uh, there's several stages that SEALs go through. Uh, but uh, again, it's, it's an absolute check the block that for every, every deploying SEAL uh, and every deploying naval aviator all come through balance. So uh, it's, again, it's a very central part of, of what we do. Um, so there's the base uh, where there's the schoolhouse, and then um, there's the range, and the range is really the most critical part. Um, you can see off the the uh, yellow uh, toned uh, land areas are what the Navy ranges are. Uh, they're B16, B9, uh, B19, B17, and B20, um, and I'll go through those individually as we go through. Um, and then the airspace stretches all the way across uh, northern Nevada. To give you a little bit of perspective, uh, the base is here. The range is 16, 19, 17, and 20. Uh, this is the special use airspace for the for the training ranges. Um, the uh, and to give you a little bit of perspective, um, Walker Lake, uh, Gabs, uh, Eureka. Battle Mountain and Austin. So give you a little bit of perspective of what that looks like in the map. So um, I talked a little bit about integrated training. Um, uh, one of the events that they host uh, several times during that month long period that, the, that those air wings are here are, uh, is called a, a large force exercise. And that's really comprised of about 20 to 30, what we call blue air, which is good guys and about uh, 15 to 25 red air, which are the bad guys. Um, the, the, the blue air takes off from the base, uh, rallies up around here. Um, they would create a scenario where if this was a hostile country and this was a coastline, that the carrier would be parked somewhere out here. They would come out here um, and have targets on our ranges. So they would come through fight through uh, simulated uh, surface-to-air missiles, uh, fight through uh, the red air, uh, the guys that, are, that have started here that are defending this area. So fight through um, all of this, uh, come here where our bombing ranges are, uh, and B B-20 and B-17, uh, and uh, drop ordnance on there. So it, it may be a scenario like we need to take out an airfield, uh, uh, some communication sites, and uh, maybe a leadership note for uh, an enemy, uh, and we need to hold that, be able to hold those those positions, and, and um, be able to have supremacy over this area for two weeks while Marine, Marines advance on the land. So that's a very that would just be a very typical situation that they work through. Um, but in the sophistication of, of how that works, your um, uh, like I said, you, you would fight through surface to air simulated uh, uh, threats. Uh, dogfight through air to air, and then have to be able to drop your targets. The sophistication that that may be is at night, and it may be uh, 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 a target.
target that you need to do that may be as big as this room to say it's the southernmost building in the group of five buildings next to the airfield but north of a fuel tar uh, north of a fuel depot so that uh, you know 20 25 30 year old kid has got to be able to get up there fly through all those threats at night and then be able to pick out that target and uh, drop uh, his ordinance or his or her ordinance on that target um, and, and not fail. And then after you drop your ordinance, um, you fly back out to the carrier. So all of these, the red air, basically like a video game, regenerates. You gotta fight back through uh, that red air and, uh, and uh, simulated uh, surface to air threats. So um, all of that usually takes two days of planning prior. The flying mission takes about 20 minutes, and there's usually about a day or so debrief afterwards. So there's there's problem solving in the beginning, there's execution of that, and then there's this whole part where uh, you might have, uh, as an aviator, you might have died in the first two minutes of the battle, and but they're going to come back and told you tell you why you died uh, or why you were successful. So there's a whole back end of that to describe, you know, you know, in ter terms of learning, you don't just get to take the test. You can take the test and then uh, get beat up why you why you did or didn't fail. So, um, uh, so uh, again, I said it, in terms of that, uh, the, the majority of, of that airspace is about 90 by 120. Um, what uh, 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 and, and that's kind of uh, on the small side in terms of what would be necessary. There's been some. Uh, uh, there's been missions that have been done off the coast of Australia where they've had about a 300 by 300 box, uh, mile box, and uh, one of the first lessons that came out of that was that can we, next year we have a bigger space to train in. So um, really in terms of, ta of, of tactics, uh, um, this, this 90 mile by 120 mile box, uh, you're really in the threat envelopes of most of modern weapons. So um, and what I find across, uh, as I talk to my colleagues across the EOD, is that um, as as technologies mature, uh, that the difficulty of, of being able to maintain and uh, contain all of your training is getting more and more difficult as, as it goes. So, um, wanted to give you a quick summary. Um, again, critical asset to DoD. Um, every avian capital aviator and every SEAL comes through Fallon as part of their training before deployment. Um, uh, in terms of uh, replicating or moving this. It, it, would be nearly impossible to move it anywhere else in the world. Um, and I said again, um, in terms of, of that uh, ability to contribute to the Department of Defense, yeah, Fallon is invaluable. I'm gonna stop really quickly to see if there's any questions. I just wanted to give you kind of a quick overview of uh, what Fallon does. So if there's no more questions, we'll move on. Um, I, I have a question. Yes, um, so when they meet their target, are they actually dropping real ammunition on the ground? Yes. Okay. So um, a part of the part of the overall training, uh, air wings bring about 1,500 to 1,800 people here. Uh, and aviators supply a very small part of that. Um, with them, they bring the ordnance folks that that build bombs uh, when they go to uh, go deploy to the carrier. So. Uh, Part of, part of that training is that uh, ordnance uh, men putting together that bomb and then loading it on there, testing it, and then making sure it comes off the, the aircraft correctly. So yeah, live ordnance is, is frequently used. Not all of it, but very frequently. And then when they're doing the, uh, the surface to air and then when they come and encounter with their, who are essentially their colleagues, right, in real planes, yep. all that is simulated? All that is simulated. Okay. So the, it's simulated air ground, so it would be you know, what you would imagine is missiles sitting on the ground, shooting aircraft, all of that simulated, just radar signatures and locks. And then the air to air, none of, there's no like live missiles or, or bullets, that's just, uh, there's pods on the aircraft that identify uh, where and how fast the aircraft go. So you, know, you basically train and lock on the bad, bad guys or vice versa. So, they register kills uh, across that board. So, so uh, um, just to give you a quick snapshot of, of what Fallon does, um, and then step into here um, in uh, 
August 26th of 2016, we came out with our uh, modernization proposal, which is basically an expansion of the land ranges uh, and uh, airspace to support that. So I want to give you a quick snapshot because this is critical to understand anything for what, uh, why we asked for, for what we asked for. Um, uh, during the full, first Gulf, Gulf War, um, uh, the original tactics for all aviation was to fly in low under the radar signatures, pop up, and then acquire a target, and then you use the aircraft to point the weapon and drop the weapon, and that was usually somewhere between two to four miles away from the target. So cruise under, you pop up, use your aircraft as, as um, to create inertia for the weapon, point that basically on a crosshair, like you would imagine to see in a movie, and, and use that to, to do that to uh, drop the, the weapon on the target. Not very accurate in the first place. Um, you're dropping, which is basically a, a dumb bomb, um, on, a, on a target. What came out of that is um, the first Gulf War is that um, 38 aircraft were shot down in the first 40 days of the conflict. Uh, the reason why is because uh, the, the tactics and techniques and procedures uh, hadn't caught up to technology uh, the uh, Iraqi uh, military had uh, radar tracking uh, uh, anti-aircraft and missiles, and they could sh easily shoot down uh, aircraft at those targets. So the, within the first 15 days of that conflict, um, the uh, overall commander for the conflict had ordered aircraft to be higher and farther away, which then made those same bombs, because you, you, really you don't really don't have better bombs, made them uh, more, more inaccurate, so you had to maybe go to a target several times or use more ordnance on each target in order to accomplish the mission. Um, that really kind of kicked off an advancement of technology um, from, through the 90s and, and 2000s. And really, kind of the, really the, the weapons that are used today are meant to get that aircraft higher and farther away. So um, what was once you know, one to four miles is now 10 to 15 miles. And that inertia is given uh, off the aircraft is the same. They're not, they're not propelled weapons, um, but the GPS technology and the laser technologies that acquire the weapons make it a lot uh, more accurate, as well as um, uh, get that get the air crews out of that threat envelope. So um, your the ability to respond to um, missiles and anti-aircraft gives you. 10 or 15 seconds more to react and get away than it would otherwise if you were closer to the target. So, I think this uh, uh, slide kind of over overviews that, um, gives a good representation. Again, the idea is to be more accurate as well as keep get your air crews out of out of that threat envelope. Um, so, having that set of uh, weapons in your arsenal. Uh, doesn't do you a lot of good when your land ranges were built off of uh, those 1950s and 1980s. Uh, our our uh, ranges here, uh, B-17, which is uh, just outside of Fallon to the uh, southeast, and then B-20, which is to the north, are basically eight by eight, eight mile by eight mile boxes. So in terms of what this slide shows is that uh, 13 mile, uh, uh, pathway that those weapons could take in a 180 degree arc. So uh, it just created a problem. You know how we deploy weapons in combat is not necessarily how tr how we train with them. So uh, combat realism is is one of the uh, main ways to to uh, have folks survive and be uh, successful on their missions when they deploy uh, to conflicts. So. Um, this, uh, this is a good example of how it would be. I said that Navy range is down here. These are the em weapons envelopes. Um, this is uh, Love Lock. So you can see all the farmland in that urban area. Uh, Highway 80 is here. So there's a, um, uh, a program called Weapons Danger Zone. And uh, that, uh, that's what's used to create these uh, arcs on, on the map. Uh, but it really gives you an, an idea of, of what would be required for how we deploy in combat versus what the land ranges are. 
So try to solve that problem. Um, what the race department did is went through, you, you, had your, you had your graduate school folks there at Fallon. What they went to is they took the 18 weapons uh, that were available and grouped them into four categories. Um, and really the uh, weapons danger zone tool that I had said earlier um, takes these um, uh, categories and then loads them in and then builds those models. So um, when, when the uh, range department went to the subject matter experts and said, hey, what do you originally need? That's that, what, they were, what they said for laser, laser guided weapons was 35,000 feet release 600 miles an hour. Um, they said from one, one to uh, 6.8 miles with an angle of this and a 360 degree, degree heading. So you can see that, that really the, the largest set of, um, of weapons group is here, which is JDAM. Um, they had asked for 35,600 uh, 600 knots, two to 13 miles, uh, a zero to, to negative 40 uh, release ang angle, and then a heading of uh, 360 degrees. What that ended up, look, what that, that, and that's really what these models were made out. So when, when we uh, looked at this uh, you know, four or five years ago and said, well, this just isn't gonna be practical for something that we can ask for. So um, we went back to the subject matter experts and asked, uh, what could we possibly do? What would be tactically acceptable? What, what would be that combat realism that you, could, that you could bring to training that would translate to your training uh, to your uh, deployment overseas? So uh, again, bring you back to JDAM. They said instead of uh, 35,000 feet, it was 30,000 feet uh, uh, MSL. And instead of two to 13 miles, limit that to 10 miles. Uh, and the, the critical element in here is um, uh, zero to 360 was the original requirement. Uh, what we had come back to was um, uh, 180 degrees. And I'm gonna explain that very briefly. So like I said, when the aircraft is flying off, uh, those bombs are released. There's a, uh, either a GPS or a laser seeker on that weapon. Um, they need to be uh, released either in a headwind or in a tailwind is if they're released uh, at a side wind and uh, uh, the jet stream could be up to 150 miles an hour at those altitudes, that what happens is it comes off and it shears that weapon sideways. So that, you know, you, you're, you're not having a propelled weapon, it's just being dropped, uh, used by, uh, by gravity. So if that weapon has a, has a seeker uh, on a target, it is blowing off target. It's, it's number one, using all the, some of the energy that uh, it gained off of flying off the aircraft in order to correct for that. Um, and then the other part that happens is that that seeker head comes off of the target and then it loses what, what it's acquiring because it only has a certain um, ability to, to pick up that laser imprint on the target. So what happens is it just loses it and it falls short and doesn't, it can't find its target. So again, so rather than 360 degrees, uh, being able to drop from any direction, uh, the subject matter expert said, well, if we, could, if we have either a tail, headwind or a tailwind, we can deploy the weapons uh, on a daily basis. So what that really came back to was that it, it, it reduced the, the land request for the Navy uh, by about 70%. You do pi R squared, take that extra three miles off, then cut it in half. It, it drops it to about 30% of, of what that original requirement was. Um, our, our, um, again, our, our Navy SEALs were in a, in a very similar situation. Uh, the uh, red, red one here is, is what's currently being done. Um, SEALs come through. Uh, one of their scenarios that they do is that they are, are, let's say, transporting some folks in Afghanistan from point A to point B in a convoy. Um, and what, uh, what they train to is, uh, you know, uh, a surprise attack, people pop up and, are, and attack the convoy, and then they're having to be able to repel that attack and, and get away. Uh, but what is occurring on our current range is, is that uh, because of the constraint um, uh, for the size of the range, is that they're only being able to shoot one way. And, and that 
dramatically reduces your tactical uh, realism because you know you drive down the road one way and all the targets pop up on that side. Well, you know you know that when you get you go back and you go drive back the other way, you know all the targets are going to be on that side. So in terms of like surprising you know seals that are really good at you know fighting and shooting targets, it, it doesn't do it doesn't do anything. You you, you do it maybe once or or you know and, and all of your all of your uh, uh, value is lost after that. So uh, again, what what the seals were were requesting is the ability to shoot 360 degrees with uh, 7.62 and uh, be able to attack several uh, targets within a 360 degree range. So really, that dictated that a, a larger footprint for the entire shooting area. This is a good example of that, where you would be driving along a road and you engage engage targets. Uh, so rather than on one side, it would be able to be able to shoot on the, on all sides of the of the, uh, uh, of the vehicle. So here's the good news. Um, not really. <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, uh, the land request is a lot, uh, and, and we we realize that from from day one and even day zero. Uh, this is a lot to ask from the state and, and citizens uh, uh, of the United States. Uh, but again, it comes back to uh, how we're going to train for the next 20 years, or 50 years, or 100 years. Um, the ranges that we had in the, that were designed in the 50s and 80s just aren't going to support that. Um, we've done what we can in terms of on that front side to try to mitigate how much land we're asking for. And then really since the uh, EIS came out back in uh, August of 2016, we've really, again, with our 200 plus engagements, trying to get out and, and get the word out and, and get good responses back. Um, uh, folks raising their hands saying, hey, this is going to affect me this way or that, that way. And try to figure out a way to see if we can accomplish a way to mitigate those those issues. Um, so, but one thing I really want to call out here is that B-16 for the SEALs, like I talked about, that request basically doubles the size to allow 360 degree uh, range. You can see the, the footprints of, of the ranges here um, really are built on that 180 degree, just looks like half of a pie. Um, same thing with our um, B-17 range here as well. Um, wanted to call out um, our Dixie Valley training area, and I'll, and I'll talk about that just a, a tiny bit later. Um, that 246,000 acres um, is open to the public, so there, there would be no access restrictions in there. Really what we're asking for is uh, a training sanctuary. Um, uh, as the state grows, um, there are several different uh, development issues. Uh, that have hopped up, uh, one being transmission lines that are, that are uh, problematic for helos that uh, train in this area, and I'll talk about a little bit more about what that is. But um, these would be closed access uh, ranges. This Dixie Valley training area open to the, uh, open to the public, um, but with restrictions to develop. So I want to ask if there's any questions, particularly that anything that really talked about some of that logic and development of the requirements for our expansion. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you were talking about the planes and the wind, um, you, you know, the airstream, mm -hmm. um, when you're in actual battle, though, you don't have a device down there that your weapons are honed in on, right? Yes, you do. Oh, you do? Yeah, you oh. have seals. A lot of times what they do for, um, for uh, 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 in, in combat situation is you deploy a seal. They would observe a target for several days. And then they would provide a laser or a GPS coordinate, and they shine a device on there on that actual target. And then the and then the the aircraft flying over, the weapon is able to, to lock in on that laser or GPS coordinate. I was just wondering because you're like, and we can't hit the the gas tank or whatever. I was yeah. like, what if it goes off and floats over, and then it doesn't yeah. know to just fall down? And that's really and and that's really kind of the crux of, of, of one of the difficult parts about the whole expansion is, is you see the, these acreage uh, increases that we're asking for here. Um, really, the target area is about 3,000 acres. I mean, and that's complex built systems with airfields. And, and so the, the impact areas are, are very, very small. The buffer area, the, the, the safety area that this request goes around is really dictated by the Department of Defense. So 
you know, that's uh, uh, taking in terms of the weapons danger zone, that's a one in 10,000 release that something can go wrong. So there's, hey, this probability of one in 10,000 a weapon could ever go off range. So um, again, to your point, um, you know, if some of those glitches happen, um, I'm sure everybody's computer works just fine every day, right? And, and weapons are the same way, you know. They, uh, things can happen, uh, the, the, the weapons that are now dropped off um, have fins on them and computer controls. You know, if one of those fins stick, sticks the wrong way, that weapon just goes, takes it wherever that fin wants it to. So um, there's a problem with that. And so that's really that, that idea, like you just said, is that, um, you know, 99% of the time it's gonna land within that, within that target area. 1% of the time it's gonna fall somewhere within that total box. Uh, but it, it, the idea is to contain every, keep this public, general public safe, and uh, and uh, contain the weapon systems inside. Right. So I'm assuming where the actual weapons land, the um, the habitat's just destroyed. Yes. So there's nothing there, but it's only the weapons will only still be dropped in those smaller boxes. You're just asking for a larger area around it, meaning habitat for say like wildlife mm -hmm. could still be maintained over time. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, and, and uh, I guess unless you have that one in 10,000 right. flaw, I mean, the buffer zone is because that's where weapons could fall, yeah. even though they're not targeted. Yep. So wildlife and habitat resources in the buffer zone, to the extent you have mistakes, could have negative impacts. I got, I got a question. I'm, with the advancement in technology being what it is at such a rapid rate, how can the military really say this is what we need for the next 20 to 50 years? I mean, that I just don't believe that. That Either that's going to get bigger or it's going to get smaller. And what I'm hearing here is the advances of technology is actually making it bigger because you need a larger buffer zone because the airplanes are higher and be dropped from further away. So as technology continues to increase, 10, 15, 20 years from now, the Navy could be coming back and say, we even need bigger expanses. So, I mean, there's there's no guarantees with that. I mean, I, you know, this was, you know, uh, this was a very difficult decision for, you know, the Navy and the Department of Defense to, to initiate first off. I mean, it, it really, what had happened was all, you know, all of these parameters for training had, you know, were developed at Fallon. Um, that had to work, march, march through the Navy chain. It got bought off uh, through their leadership um, and then passed up to the Department of Defense. So you know, it was several iterations of explanations why. Um, so there's no guarantee. I mean, it, right. it, so the, the joke is we could have sharks with lasers on their head in 20 years. We don't, we don't know. But we had planned out for a minimum of 20 years. Um, you know, maybe you know, this one in 10,000, you know, because the weapons are, or the technology is that much better that they shrink in, in 20 years, or you know maybe we're we're asking for for, for more. I would anticipate that we, we wouldn't, um, because I said this is a large ask in the first place. But there's already weapons groups um, that are in the Navy inventory that shoot from 180 and 200 miles. So, but we're not supporting those. I mean that that would be the the, the criticality of Fallon is is the um, is the ability. Uh, for aircraft crews to uh, have mountain ranges in between and, and you know have to fly over and find a valley and, and uh, you know and, and you because you can't you know from 20 miles you can't see that uh, if you uh, launch on a sea range where they tra train a lot of these uh, large standoff weapons and shoot for 200 miles I mean you see the island out there in the Pacific like you know 80 miles away and you launch the weapon and you know there's no sophistication in that. Um, you, you know here in Nevada you know, the, you know, that replication of, of uh, change in terrain and things like that. So you're you're absolutely right. I mean, there's no there's no guarantees with this, but it was a very difficult you know, test to 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 get that advanced within the Department of Defense, as well as we knew that we were going to um, have to go out and to the general public and, and, and make the ask as well. Um, So I'll walk through uh, the individual ranges. Um, 
P16 is to the southwest of Fallon. Uh, the way this range was designed uh, was for the seals, like I talked about, being able to drive along a road like this and be able to shoot anywhere within this hatched box um, out towards here. So uh, the the weapons range of the 7.62 was about uh, four kilometers, so that distance is all about the same. But it, but it allows uh, again that re combat realism where you can change this up. Um, you can drive down this road or have a combat village here. It really you know you can you can keep changing that 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 training so it's not the same. And you don't create that static point. So when a seal comes through in 2019, he sees things that when he comes back in 2022, you know, as a part of another deployment, you know, he's not he's not going to have that same training. So it just it creates a whole different uh, edge of scenarios they, that they can do. But the idea is again contained this way, and then being able to contain everything that was shot on the range. On most areas, you're just shooting real ammunition you're not bombing that area or anything like that so uh, within there uh, most of it it's going to be uh, small arms which is 50 cal and below um, the there is some ordinance there's some bombs dropped with their inert bombs but uh, again part of that uh, sophistication of, uh, of uh, the combat scenarios is that um, if you're being attacked on all sides uh, being able to call in uh, air support, so which is very critical because you said, hey, we're being attacked. We can't, we can't see this guy. He's off here. Being able to have coordinate with a uh, helicopter or a fixed wing aircraft to come over and drop, which is basically a bomb about this big. It's called Mark 76 uh, on that target. So there's no, uh, this B-16 here above itself, the tan area, has been a bombing range since the, since the 40s. Um, and the light, uh, like I said, those light, uh, those inert, light inert bombs are dropped in here already. Uh, that, uh, and so again, there would be no um, live bombs dropped on that area, only inert. But it would be in coordination with those landing Uh B-20, which is one of our uh, primary ranges, again, you can see that half pie shape. Uh, the reason uh, again, why we had asked for, for not just having uh, increasing the land, land range of one range, uh, and it was asking for two, is that again, that combat scenarios where you have to split off and attack at two, attack, uh, uh, two targets, an airfield and a leadership node. So again, it, it increases that sophistication of, of how um, those events are run. Um, one thing I want to call out is um, these purple areas which is an overlap of the Fallon uh, Wildlife Refuge, uh, which was transferred uh, by presidential order in, I think, 1932. Um, there's not a lot of assets uh, out there. Uh, and um, it, you, as you can see, the, only the purple is the Fallon Refuge. Um, the That area is kind of that low, lowland scrub and uh, uh, sand dune area, so there's no like waterfowl area there, uh, and and the proposal would be that we would have an overlapping um, withdrawal with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and that that area we would have no land use changes, and then we would assist U.S. Fish and Wildlife with whatever um, types of uh, management they, that they want had wanted in there, but. Um, this is fairly, I mean, this scrub area is, is fairly typical of all of this footland, foot, uh, footland area to that um, north, north and uh, west part of the border. Any questions on that? So we, it would be a cutoff of public access, but it would be no land use change. Again, the target areas for B20 are isolated here. This is just that open buffer area. Uh, yeah, that's checkerboard. Um, um, uh, of the, uh, it's, the larger proportions are uh, owned by Newmont. Um, uh, Churchill County down here in the south side, I think they had taken that over some, for some sort of tax reasons long ago. 
And then uh, New Nevada Lands, which you know holds a bunch of that uh, area, um, has some of this other northern checkerboard as, as well. So that, in terms of that, that would be um, uh, a, a purchase from, from and move it from uh, private property to federal. And uh, the total land request um, uh, for non-federal is about uh, 70, if my memory corrects me, about uh, 60, 64,000 total acres. About 58 of it is locked up in this checkerboard land. So the vast majority of, of the requests for uh, non-federal private lands are, you know, are in, this, in this area, this is the checkerboard. Uh, walk through B17. Um, again, this is our, our another one of our premier range. Um, our B20 range is, is kind of flat and, and boring; it doesn't have a lot of sophistication, uh, which is why our B17 range is, is so critical. Um, these hashed areas are, are, are um, the, those primary target areas. Um, as you can see, you know the, the areas here that are used for the JDAM. Are you know within that half circle, um, you know roughly 10 miles from that border. Um, this also represents how to the, the uh, greatest habitat value for uh, the state of Nevada. Um, we um, bighorn sheep uh, resi reside uh, up in this northern uh, mountain range as well as the southern mountain range of the Monte Cristos. Um, our original proposal had pushed, our original proposal for um, B-17 had this half pie um, up in this area. Um, there's uh, three reasons why we had shifted it from this orientation that it pushed in this mountain range. One is this communication site here on Fairview Peak. One is the hunting, hunting value here in Sand Springs Range. And then third was access to um, the mine, uh, Rawhide Mine that's down here, Highway 839. Uh, we just were able to pull that completely off of the highway. The original plan was to just relocate that, um, but really what we had walked to was um, uh, just stay off that highway, which then unfortunately forced us to uh, you know, overlap on Highway 361, the road to Gabs, which is right here. Uh, but the Navy is going to pay for a, a realignment uh, that brings that highway outside of that range. So that access to GABS um, will stay open. Any initial questions on um, B-17? Again, we can pop back here as we kind of walk through some of the other points. Um, again, uh, Dixie Valley training area. Um, uh, you can read some of the, the, the points here. Um, again, the land request here uh, was really uh, to support uh, what we call non-hazardous training. We just walked through all the hazardous training, dropping bombs, shooting guns. Uh, there's a, another whole uh, set of training that's done which does involve any, either one of those. Um, and that's performed here in the Dixie Valley training area. Uh, the, the main request here was to, to uh, prevent incompatible development. Um, one of the mission sets that occurs quite a bit right in this area is combat search and rescue. You talked about that large force exercise where all of the aircrafts were fighting each other. Um, um, and then you know they finish the event, they come back and debrief. Um, they will um, grab an aviator. Um, he or she will be then taken in a truck and brought out from the base over here into Dixie Valley, uh, taken out of the truck and just dropped off. The truck drives away and said, well, now you have to survive. Uh, you just got shot down as part of this event. Um, now you have to, to survive out here. It may be January. Um, you might have forgotten to take, forgotten to take a coat um, as, you know, in your aircraft. Your aircraft's nice and cozy. You might have forgotten that. They basically grab you what you have uh, on your person and throw you out there. Um, uh, part of the scenario then becomes that you have to evade the bad guys and, and get found by the good guys. You may spend uh, several out, uh, hours out here uh, running around in the desert, maybe day, maybe at, at night. Um, again, evading the bad guys and, and um, 
uh, being found by the good guys. That, um, that may um, uh, involve uh, helicopters, which represent you know, a threat to bad guys trying to find, find the down pilot, and the good guys you know, working in that area in low, air, low, uh, low altitudes. Um, may have to do with fixed wing aircraft flying over the top of that, providing air support for the whole scenario. Um, uh, when they think they found that downed aviator, uh, one of the things that, th that they do is they um, break a, like a glow stick and swirl it over the head, their head so it makes a nice big glare out. Um, if it's at night, uh, that can only be seen on night vision goggles. So um, you're flying at night at low altitudes trying to find that downed aviator. Um, there could be bad guys shooting at you as part of these scenarios. So it's a very intense, uh, sophisticated uh, training environment here. What we're asking for is is no development within this area. What, what we like is no development. Um, and, and really the, the ask uh, for, for Dixie Valley is, is to prevent um, geothermal and mining in that area. Again, we know that that's a big ask because we're, we're uh, asking to limit uh, economic development. Uh, what we've come out of uh, for our um, uh, from all, all of our scoping and comment periods is that we would allow limited development on the west side of the Dixie Valley training area uh, and that would be only uh, geothermal development. So um, there's a, quite a bit of geothermal resource here along the foothills uh, but we would allow no mining and geothermal in geothermal uh, in this other area. As you can tell, it, it overlaps some of the WSAs. Um, there's no intent, uh, uh, again, for, for any development to occur there. In fact, the, the lack of development is really what we're looking for in that area. So the land uses for WSAs are, are pretty much the same. Uh, the, the purposes are certainly different, but uh, we're asking for, again, no development in that area. Are there any questions on that? Uh, again, walk through a little bit um, uh, why the lack of lighting and, and development in those areas is so important. Um, this is a snapshot uh, of Fallon uh, Highway 80. Uh, this area represents an area where there's no light. And you're, as you're flying along on goggles at night, you're only using uh, natural light to, to guide yourself by. So if you wanted to fly and, and have light, there's lots of opportunity around this area. Uh, but this area is going to, the idea is to preserve that, that nighttime environment. So uh, as, um, we're going to jump back to that B-17 slide. Um, well, uh, the Navy is, is, uh, has worked very closely with NDAO and, and uh, NDAO staff, um, and they're certainly keeping the sportsmen and, and uh, conservation uh, uh, citizens of Nevada in mind here. Um, uh, uh, so uh, as part of the scoping comments, um, one of the ideas that we would do is, is have a hunting program. Um, as, this, as this idea has matured, we've worked with, uh, with Endow. I think we've met with Endow staff five or six times in the last several months to kind of refine some of this. Uh, so the, the Navy um, would make a commitment for a 15-day access. Uh, that would likely be in uh, uh, December time frame, which fits very closely for a, a, a time that the range is 90 plus percent of the time closed anyway. Um, we would have uh, a working group that would have Endow, um, uh, likely BLM, and then the Navy staff, and they would work several times a year um, and have working documents. So some of the commitments that weren't necessarily built in the MOU, which is our MOA, which is the next sideline item, um, that um, any kind of those working level things were, were advanced through. Um, we would um, uh, let hunters know um, that have tags in that area uh, the, of the schedule, that 15-day window, window uh, when that would be. Uh, we would add some flexibility to that future um, hunting program. Uh, right now, the uh, hunting program would only involve bighorn sheep. Um, there is a little desire to have mule deer and antelope as well. Uh, the, uh, the issue with that is that um, 
it, it certainly creates the uh, problem of complexity and being able to manage that, uh, but we're certainly not going to leave that those opportunities out coming into the future. Mm -hmm. um, we would allow um, endow access for wildlife monitor monitoring and management. That access to be range closure time, but we've um, over the last 30 years, and now has pretty much had better, better access to be able to go out and count herds and do the things that they need to. Um, we would also, you know, allow access for maintenance and construction of water, water structures, um, guzzlers, and things like that. You know, that would be something you need, you need, needs to be fixed or constructed. We would continue to allow that. In fact, over the last, at least over, I know the last uh, 10 to 15 years, the Navy's cooperated quite a bit on, on the ability to uh, finish some of those, those projects on our current range. So really, the way forward uh, is uh, working towards having camping on our B-17. That's an issue, of course, because it's a, it's a live bombing range. Uh, it's going to take some range clearance and things like that. But I think everybody involved would like to see the ability to camp on isolated sites within the range. Uh, I think it allows for bet much better uh, much better hunting opportunity, much less travel time, and access to the range. Uh, but I certainly, we certainly have to take that up and brief that to the Navy leadership so they have uh, an understanding of what kind of risks that they, they would be taking having sportsmen on, on the range. Um, as well as working towards a simplified range check-in, check-out. Nellis has a very uh, uh, hard line when people come in, uh, what we were, what we're trying to work towards is having the um, ability for uh, hunters to access the range, having an honor, being an honor system, uh, be able to come on the range. You check in when you come in on the range, and then when you leave the range, whether it's to go somewhere else to hunt or to leave because you 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 harvested an animal, um, the ability to to check in and check out without having a very hard line that you have to cross with security guards and things like that. So we're looking at doing, uh, you know, possibly some GPS type of technology. You know, uh, a lot of folks have seen that spot uh, uh, device. Uh, you know, as long as the hunter uh, was, was um, you know, in charge of your party um, and you held that spot on you, um, we could work on having some, some you know, maps that are, that, are, that are out there for the sportsmen to use as well as you know, maybe a, a, a shape file that you download in your GPS so you know where those boundaries are that you don't leave those access areas. Any questions on that program? Uh, another item that had brought, been brought up was uh, wildfire management. Um, uh, again, uh, that's prompted us, BLM has talked to us about the last three or four years about developing a, um, a uh, comprehensive wild, wildfire management plan. Um, this uh, project really has spurred us to do that. Um, this year we've started a, a kind of comprehensive plan that um, will again, you know, multi-agency coordination, fire prevention, uh, fire suppression activities, who fight the fire and where, and then the rehabilitation and, and recovery uh, for the range. We're also going to, we also have planned for a fund for 2022, which would take, in, in case of the larger, uh, more developed and, and expanded ranges, how those, those the, the same idea, but on the same idea of, of uh, wildfire management plan, but uh, uh, apply it to the, to the future ranges. Uh, Want to briefly walk through, too, again, uh, uh, a little bit of, of uh, uh, for uh, not only the expansion, but some of the conservation efforts we've done. Um, again, this is a little bit better overlay, lets you see uh, a lot of the political and uh, land ownership, uh, land management uh, ideas that are underneath the airspace. Um, so within that, we realize that um, the Navy is a, is, a, is, a, is a larger partner and, and uh, neighbor within this area. And you can see the variety of folks that we that we deal with on a on, a, on an annual daily basis along this side. So um, one of the issues that's facing uh, uh, everybody in the West is uh, safe routes. Um, this map is an overlay of our uh, general 
uh, airspace area. Some of this is an actual special use airspace. We have a, a Reno MOA that's right up here. So this, you know, our general planning area incorporates all of that. Um, but we realize that uh, if uh, Sage Grouse is listed, that um, it's you know not only gonna could it affect the Navy, uh, but it could uh, affect all stakeholders. So um, we uh, uh, have partnered in the last five years, uh, trying to stand up uh, a, a conservation uh, network and a series of plans that, that kind of put together the ability for us to uh, work broadly uh, with, with a lot of different partners and, and really uh, focus on conservation, uh, you know, in, injecting Department of Defense money and planning into this area for conservation easements and, and rehabilitation uh, projects. We do have one easement here um, that's uh, at Smith Creek uh, that we finished in 2016. Uh, a list of our partners that we're working with, um, really the Department of Defense uh, in, in terms of the Navy and, and, and really my, my involvement, um, we came in and, and you know there's a whole network of folks that are working together. Um, what we did is none of these folks have to do this. Um, what we you know what we did is we we came together that, that five years ago and realized that we had a lot of really core goals uh, that were that were very very similar and uh, really um, we meshed very easily and very quickly. Um, again, none of these are have to do's. Um, you know, these, this is time given freely, understanding that there's this uh, larger objectives and goals that we're trying to accomplish. So our partners have been awesome. This is the one, this is the one part of my job that I think I find most rewarding is, is working with these folks across the state. Again, purposes, objectives, conservation easements um, uh, on working lands, uh, uh, typical restoration projects, pinion juniper removal, spring improvements, noxious weed abatement, and as well as uh, we're trying to work with uh, some of the researchers to figure out if what we're doing on the ground is really you know paying off in the future so we can maybe change change direction as we move forward uh, part of that purpose and objective kind of is captured in this 2016 quote um, in la uh, September 2016 or 2015 when the decision was made not to, to uh, launch uh, list of sage grouse uh, into the ESA. And really, again, uh, you know, our working group, is, is the intent is just to put another brick in the wall. You know, we, we know we're not going to solve the entire problem, but it, when this comes to review, possibly next year, or six years, or 15 years, we want to see that overall conservation effort that's been uh, put forward by, us, by our, our partners here in the state. Step through things, uh, Repi Challenge, um, uh, our partnership uh, picked up two, $2.16 million for uh, easements and restoration work in 2015. We picked up an extra uh, $750,000 in 2019. Um, our request going into this year is for $200,000 and that's a, a partnership with Endow to try to do kind of a 50-50 blend on uh, some of that restoration work um, in the state, uh, as well as uh, we have uh, four prospective uh, ranches in Nevada that we're working with the landowners to see if they uh, would like to have a conservation easement on their land. Then the idea is then to see what kind of projects we can do around that land, either on a watershed or an allotment, to try to then vastly increase the value of that conservation. Uh, also working towards a Sentinel landscape designation, uh, that was a memorandum of agreement that was placed, I think, in 2014 uh, between Department of Defense, Department of Ag, Department of Interior to kind of cooperatively work together. That designation, again, um, doesn't really bring too much. We're hoping that, um, that if we uh, could get that designation, a lot of times there's a, a coordinator uh, built into that. And, you know, everybody's got, I said, everybody wants to do this work. But it's a lot of times a little bit more difficult difficult to coordinate. So uh, a lot of times that designation comes with the coordinator, which would help out some of that work. That's all I got for you. Um, happy to answer any questions or provide a contact uh, for any follow up going into the future. Um, certainly happy to come back and talk. 
with any of you individually or um, you know as a, as a group uh, can update you folks uh, or provide any additional information that um, you may want to see. Questions? I mean, I'll make myself available if there's anything that uh, comes up. Uh, certainly don't think this is the end of the conversation. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Rob, I appreciate you coming and talking to us, um, understanding it a little more in detail. And um, For me, I'm not even sure where to really begin. Um, I felt like it was important to say a couple of things. Um, you know, it, uh, from my perspective, um, you know, I mean, we all want to see a healthy, a healthy uh, military and healthy and well-trained people, of course. I mean, things are tough out there, and I'm not going to get on a soapbox with all that stuff. But to, and from my perspective, despite the fact uh, of all these concerns, it already feels like a done deal. Um, so it, it, it almost, uh, I, hope, I hope it's not, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, and, and some of the evaluation here, you know, um, the losses are, are extensive. It's not just a, a little bit. It's not just a little here. It's not just a little here. It's it's a it's kind of a lot of everything. I mean, there's lots of that. Lot. What makes Nevada an awesome place to be is the ability to go around and get into things and see things and go places. And um, we're losing those opportunities. And, and uh, I think a lot of us up here have, have uh, um, touted ourselves as multiple use, and we're losing some of that ability unless you're Bighorn sheep hunter. Um, uh, well, you know, if you like, um, you know, and um, and specifically somebody with a tag. Um, so um, I, I'm really struggling with with some of the the stuff. The first thing that popped into my mind, and I know that uh, Commissioner uh, Chairman Johnston mentioned it, was uh, technology is going to continue to advance, and we're talking, you know, every 30 years there seems to be um, a need to to advance. So 30 years from now, what are we talking about? And um, you know, where's the end, I guess, is what it really boils down to. So we can build tolerance now, um, get used to it, I guess, and eventually go through this again and just, just keep perpetuating to an end point where there's nothing left. Um, where does it end? And that's, that's what crosses my mind. Um, I won't get into too much detail, but, um, uh, you know, I, I think that there's a, uh, I think that, that I think that there's a, you're trying to create an awareness or have an awareness about how it affects hunting and stuff, but there are other interests out there. Um, you know, people like the wildlife view, and, uh, um, you know, not all habitats are seem disposable. You know, I know it seems like desert scrub or, you know, uh, um, an alkali flat, but it all has value and uh, in some form. And, and uh, so I, I just, I guess that the, the whole thought behind it is, um, um, it's, it's way more, um, there's way more going on on this than appeared on the surface. That's why I appreciate you coming and sharing that at least. At least I, I do have a little better understanding, probably not to the extent that I'd like, um, but I do appreciate uh, uh, hearing a little bit more from your perspective. And I, I guess I have probably more concerns than I did when, when you came in, but um, probably in a, in, a, in a good way, just to the fact that having a little more knowledge. So I don't know how to frame it all up. I'll let somebody else talk. For yeah. And is it a in terms for me, I mean, I can provide my contact information if you want to have a conversation, if you want me to drive to wherever you are and sit down with you and walk through a little bit more. Again, that was one of the main purposes of, of you know, doing this, a lot of this outreach is just to provide understanding. And I'm not trying to twist your arm and make you like it or not like it any, any better. Uh, but that explanation is certainly critical because then you can make an informed decision. Um, you, know, you know, this has been shaped a lot. Um, by our partners, um, I'm sure not as much as they wish that it was, uh, but uh, you know, in, in terms of you know, like this is a done deal. Um, you know, we're we're continuing to refine this. Um, I, I, you know, from the Department of Defense standpoint, this is a very critical issue. Um, you know, having having the ability to train, especially for the Navy, there's nowhere else in the world to do this. So, you know, unfortunately, that that that, that um, uh, ask has to be born somewhere, and, and you know, we could move it to Texas, or we could ask the same things the citizens of Texas or the citizens of South Dakota. I mean, it, it, it's a very difficult thing uh, for us to ask this, and, and it was you know a lot of soul seeking, you know, 
from the maze to, to really start and initiate this. So, I, so I guess from that standpoint, maybe this is rhetorical. If it, if it's if it's absolutely imperative, um, what's sort of soul search? There's nothing to really talk about. It's just something that has to be done. It's a necessary evil, I guess, in that sense. And so that's what I'm struggling with is the uh, the the the. the the thought of coming in and negotiating some things to make it feel a little better, when in fact, um, what's there to talk about? Um, if it's if it's paramount and it's going to happen, you know, I guess I appreciate everybody coming to the, you know, trying to offer some things to make it a little more tolerable, a little more manageable. But uh, the bottom line is, is that it's a huge impact. Um, there's probably not a lot to say into it ultimately. Um, that's uh, and um, that's kind of where I'm coming from, and, and uh, you know. Uh, if I, if I were to create a list, or if everybody in this room were to create a list um, of things, uh, if it didn't fall onto that list that you had right there, it probably, you know, probably wouldn't go anywhere. And that, that's what I'm saying. So it's not really a negotiation thing. It's it's uh, trying to make everybody feel a little bit better about what's happening and um, yeah. likely to happen. And, and uh, you know, that that's, we'll just call it what it is, and, that, and uh, that's just where I'm at. So uh, I'm trying to work my way through it. And, you know what what avenues are there, and um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, yeah I said if you want to continue the conversation, more than yeah, happy yeah, to provide. I, I appreciate that. I, I guess I'll add something. I guess part of my problem with the public outreach is I read the the materials that I received. When I read these materials, <laughs> it makes me feel immediately that if I don't support this or question it in any way. I don't value freedom, I don't value the members of our military, and I, I don't appreciate what they do for us. And, and that's the problem I have with some of the outreach, is it, 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 and they're coming into a very patriotic part of this state and this country. What, I mean, you drive into Hawthorne, what is the, one of the things you notice when you drive into Hawthorne? It's the big American flag, it's a patriotic community. And and I and I appreciate the outreach. I really do. But when the outreach is made in a way that makes me feel unpatriotic if I don't support it, it's it's I guess effective outreach. But <laughs> I guess it's very effective outreach. Practice bad outreach. But it's also it's also outreach that, that that boxes you in and I have to step back and look at this as an as a wildlife commissioner. And I, it, it just makes me always think that Nevada's wide open spaces are a blessing and a curse. They're a blessing because we enjoy it. They're a curse because people who don't spend time in those wide open spaces don't value it. And I just think of, and, and I know it's apples and oranges in terms of the types of training in that. If the Navy and the Department of Defense were talking about the Mountain Warfare Training Center of the Marine Corps, and saying we're going to expand this down the eastern Sierra, no way, wouldn't happen. It's in the state of California down the eastern Sierra. It would not be palatable. It would not pass. It would go nowhere. But since it's out there in Nevada, eh, it just it, it it it's just it's easier. And I, I struggle with it. And and when it's on the backs of what we heard yesterday regarding. Uh, the Desert Wildlife Refuge and what's north of Las Vegas is just more and more and more. And when I hear, oh, this little piece here in Dixie Valley, it's just so de development doesn't occur. <coughs> yeah, that's the next expansion. No developments there, makes expansion there further. Where's it in? How much does Nevada have to give? We've given a lot. Um, it, it's very, very hard. It's very, very hard for us um, on this board for a variety of reasons. I do really appreciate the very, very thorough background, the outreach, the information. It's just a very, and I think I, sh I share Commissioner McNinch's sentiment, it's going to be done. I, I feel that way about what's going to happen uh, down south. Too. I think the Department of Defense is going to get what they want because people aren't going to have the wherewithal to say no to military readiness. But I also question how much of this is being driven by the warfare that's occurred since 9-11 and where our terrain, from what I understand, fits in with what's happened. 
what who's to say where we're going to be 20 years from now and that i i just it's a tough it's just very difficult i don't question i don't question the military's motives it's it's not that yeah and i don't think that's the intent of the yeah. outreach materials at all i mean it, i mean I don't, we've had I don't, a lot of we've had a lot of good input and a lot of good you know it, as I said, I'm sure everybody would like to see things shaped more uh, uh, than really than, than it has been. But um, in terms of what the, you know, the B-17 range, you know, modifying and moving it off some essential portions. I mean, that that was input that we ne certainly never would have internalized and said, well, how about we do this or how about we do that? So I mean, um, again, it's a, I don't, don't want to lessen you know, folks' concerns, but. Um, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of in input in, in, in terms of you know this is this request you know wasn't really a want it was a need you know we we had had a lot less a lot of soul searching a lot of uh, things to prove internally and externally so um, I don't think anybody uh, from our side wants to to you know minimize anybody's concerns but you know it, it's uh, uh, you know in terms of how military readiness and training occurs over the next 20 years or 50 years. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very essential part of I it. Mean, this, this is painful for us, because I mean, uh, there's gonna be a lot of money spent on the um, front side, as well as uh, management uh, and, and uh, operations and maintenance that are gonna happen over the next you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years that we're gonna have to pick up as well. So um, yeah, understood completely. But I don't understand how that's painful to the military. I mean. I, I get it. This is this is this is a need. This is where the existing air station exists. That's the best place to put it. We're just the ones that have to take the pill. So, um, and, and, you know, it wasn't or Rob. I wasn't really going to open that door too much, but um, I will just with one of my examples. You kind of had listed out the, the money that had been spent on the conservation and stuff. And, um, the things that have been done. Um, I, I know for a fact we've got conservation groups in Nevada that have spent ten times that over the years um, on things, and so you know there, there's a real commitment there. Um, but probably some of the money that is going to be lost to not having deer hunters going there or people that are recreating in other ways coming through that to the local economies to directly to the department because they're not going to be able to sell tags in there. Um, it, probably going to be more substantial than, than what's being put into the conservation aspects of it. I, just from the chart that I saw, and I, I don't know, maybe there's more, more to it than that. I, I don't want to be too under, I don't want to be unfair about that, but uh, the bottom line is, is that, uh, you know, people that, uh, uh, wildlife interests and people that recreate in the state of Nevada, uh, certainly um, the local economies are very dependent on that stuff. And I understand that, you know, military, certainly for Fallon, is incredibly important from an economic standpoint, but um, you know, this has a little different hit, possibly, and, and so I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I didn't realize I think about that, those things. And, realize the conservation work is not a one for one. We're not right. swapping it out for I'm this understood. pain that's caused from that. Understood. It was just that you know that's a hey, we need yeah. to do the right. Portions. I understand. You're trying right to point yeah. out that you're not blind to the fact that it, it's helpful and yeah. stuff. I get but that. I was but. informing the, the just the commission that you know it, it's it's more simple than just you know. Yeah than just the military activities here. But it also brings up, I think, something that was alluded to earlier in this meeting. When Nevada communities want a little bit of public land, there is a huge ask. If you want the little bit of the transfer of this public land into private ownership, this is all the things you're gonna have to do. Lyon County did it. We heard about Mineral County today. I just wish that the same rules kind of applied in reverse, that when the federal government wants more, they're willing to give the state a little more in return for what they're getting. And I understand the immediate response that I'm going to get to that is, well, we're giving you the protection of your freedom and, and, and the best military that the United States can possibly have. I understand. But there seems to me, with all the resources, the federal government and that, that if they are going to take more of our public land for certain uses and cut off public access, there could be more in return to this state in the same way that they demand more from us when we want private ownership, for example, for a copper mine, for a shooting complex. Uh, it just feels like we get steamrolled a little bit.
Yeah. So, but I, I would say that certainly, you know, in above itself, the, this action is a lands bill. So, I mean, if you have concerns like that, or if there's um, some sort of trade off that needs to be done, like I've been talked before. Um, then I would bring that to your representatives for sure. I mean, I, I, because they're the ones that are going to ultimately have to vote for this in Congress. And, you know, if, if the, you know, there was small chunks of, um, of important uh, ecologically or economic areas, um, the Navy, the Navy with this is standing up for themselves and saying, this is what we need. I mean, if there's some part of that, I mean, I would certainly talk to the legislators and say, hey, you know, as part of this, some of, some economic impact, like you had said, are being taken away. Can we help maybe push some initiatives forward? But um, you know, some of that certainly can be captured within this, the Navy's action. But um, you know, some of that is, you know, in terms of you know, the the Navy doesn't have any responsibility like Congress does over federal land. So you know, if there's something that could be identified that is important, um, you know, for conservation value, economic value, again that. The, the folks that, you know, they certainly can bring that up to me and I, I can share that with our team and, you know, I, I regularly talk to our legislators, but if it's something that, you know, th thinks this needs to be important, that, like you had said, uh, some sort of one-for-one -one trade off then uh, that discussion could be had down I, I guess I don't compartmentalize the federal government the way the federal government compartmentalizes itself. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> so. No, I appreciate the conversation. So again, I said, uh, if there's more questions that we need to be fielded beyond this, or you know, either uh, you know, as a personal concern as a member of the commission or the commission in general, more than happy to come back again, have a personal conversation. Anything. Thank you, Secretary Wasley. Did you have something? I did. Thank you, Chairman Johnston. Um, two things, really quick, relative to. Um, the notion of the one for one or the lands bills. Certainly, we've had conversations with Congressman Amade. I know um, he's supportive of that type of model. Some of the challenges that exist, however, is that minerals are where minerals are, uh, valid and existing rights. Uh, same thing with grazing allotments, having uh, viable operations that aren't already occupied. So, some of those scenarios may work well from. Um, from some of the lands bills perspectives and, and getting some land for a shooting range, there are some other complications there. But I was um, wanted to thank Rob for coming in, uh, reaching out. Um, but also, I've heard a couple commissioners talk about you know this foregone conclusion, seeing the writing on the wall, knowing where we're going to get. Can you explain what remains of the process and the associated timeline from where we are to uh, some pending decision? Absolutely. Uh, so, I said, give you the total perspective. Uh, project was kicked off officially August of 2016. Um, there public uh, initial public uh, period uh, for comments. Um, those comments were taken in. The draft uh, EIS was released in November of 2018. Had a comment period for 90 days through February of 2019. So now we're at the point of um, taking all of those uh, comments and uh, coalescing them um, and uh, figuring out ways path forward, types of mitigation, types of different paths forward, um, what we can do, what we can't do um, in terms of what, what, what uh, effectively uh, can coordinate with the range. Um, the, um, we're working with uh, our 14 cooperating agencies, which include all of the affected counties, uh, NDAO as well. Uh, and so um, in the near term, we're going to release the response, their response to their individual comments um, to them uh, here, I think in July or August. Um, they know kind of what the response back for those concerns were. Um, um, then over the next you know, ha have an opportunity to get that. Um, there's uh, a draft version of that EIS would be released to our to our cooperating agencies for review again. Another probably in September time frame. Um, that September time frame after we would get those responses responses back to that um, that version uh, that we released to our cooperating agencies. Really, the that that September to December January time frame would be incorporating those final comments. 
with a release of the final EIS in uh, December, January timeframe. Uh, then it would be uh, signed by the Secretary of uh, the Navy, and then uh, those recommendations would be forwarded to Congress. So that and then it would, you know, in terms of any kind of action through authorization or appropriation, uh, would be picked up in the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act or Appropriations Act, uh, September, which was what 15 months from now, uh, for approval by Congress and then funding for those individual projects. So you know we're in uh, kind of critical elements where hey, if there's any final comments to, to the project, it needs to be done now. Uh, for incorporation for that final year. Does that help? Is that okay? Is, is there anything else that I missed that you had specific that would be helpful? Commissioner Hubs. When you're saying if there are any final comments, they have to be done now. What does that mean in terms of dates? I just wanted to go back and revisit your last comment. Uh, so. Uh, you're going to release uh, a version of the EIS to our cooperative agencies uh, over the next several months and um, get kind of their last uh, edits and comments on the document. Uh, so in terms of comments, the public comment period uh, for the draft EIS was November of last year to February of 2019. So there are opportunities for the public, but in terms of um, the count, uh, our 40 cooperative agencies, again, um, our federal land managers, the counties, and then like uh, Department of Wildlife, uh, they're going to have a, a, a final look at the, the document. So in regard to that, what would be helpful, I think, even for the commission to maybe see um, from a wildlife perspective, we now know the maps pretty well. We know the purpose of what's going to be going on in each of those areas. But have we really looked at, I'm sure your staff has, but the resources compared to the impacted areas and just have like a good discussion about that in case there's one last important comment we possibly in, in the comments that have been provided today yeah I, I know that um, as a cooperating agency in the development of that there's certain restrictions uh, confidentiality restrictions on some of those comments but I know um, that there are a number of public documents, and I guess I would ask if uh, Habitat Division Administrator uh, Alan Janay um, could provide some context on what we have that might be useful. Uh, certainly, I mean, we, under Governor Sandoval, um, had an interagency uh, cooperative effort with Division of Minerals, uh, Department of Agriculture, um, you know, had a compiled perspective from all the affected agencies and uh, the governor uh, wrote a letter so there there are a number of things that are already in the public record um, but I don't know if Alan can speak specifically to what additionally you know we could do or might share but certainly um, we've been engaged in terms of providing input on the wildlife impacts from from the beginning yeah thank you uh, for the record, Alan Janay, Habitat Division Administrator. Yeah, um, there are public records that we have, you know, commented. Um, those are available. Our last comment to the draft EIS, we, you know, we could give an update as to what we did within that. Um, I believe those are open even under the, the confidentiality clause of the cooperating agency is, is that those are public record. Um, so I believe we could talk about what our concerns were to that point and how we commented to that um, and uh, probably speak a little bit more to the timelines um, and the, the opportunities for you know input into the process because this is a legislative EIS so this is a, a, a little bit different dog than what we normally deal with where it's a agency that makes a decision um, the Navy's going to make sorry. The Navy's going to make the decision, but it's going to be um, approved by Congress. The withdrawal and an expansion would be approved by Congress. And back to Alan Janay. Um, so again, like we've seen with Nellis, is there's an opportunity. It's signed off by, you know, the Secretary of Navy or 
or the official at that level, but it does go to a legislative process. And so there is opportunity within the bills program, um, not only for, like he was saying, those mitigation opportunities, land bill or land exchanges, um, but also possible tweaks within the legislative process. And so um, probably a, a little bit more overview to that may be helpful to the commission in, in portraying the direction in which you can go within the the final few steps of this process. Additional questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you again, Mr. Rule, for the presentation. Great. I really again, do thanks, and if, if there's follow up, please let me know. Thank you. Um, how are we all doing? Does people need a break? Okay. Why don't we uh, return here at uh, 1255, we'll wrap up the meeting then, we just have a couple more agenda items.